Hey V, line them up. What up, CBR fam? How y'all doing this week? Once again, we appreciate y'all for coming in and this uh knock me wide foot having motherfucking Kino is late once again. I want you y'all to know it's Keto's fault. I don't know how it's Keno's fault, but it's Keno's fault. Actually, no, nah, I'm just messing with y'all. Uh his his son's uh, football schedule is, has changed a little bit. So he'll always be in. You know, around this time, we always be cutting it close. That's just how it's going to go. If you got kids, you understand. Um, I got two kids, I understand. Um, but first of all, man, uh, I just want to say, man, shout out to Lupe. Congratulations, man. Um, Lupe had his first clutch hatch. So uh, super congratulations, Lupe. It was it was an honor meeting you, man. I hope I get to see you again, you know, in September. Um, Tradesman, I don't really hate you, man. I just be fucking with you, man. I, I love you, dog. Uh, but you always gonna get these jokes for all those gay memes you put up. Uh, and it was it was the gayest of the gay, bro. So so you never gonna get out of that. I'm always gonna have I'm just gonna have some some harsh words for you. Um, what up, Didi? <coughs> what up, Chris? Uh, I'm gonna show Chris's his, Chris's um commercial real quick. <laughs> is our cousin Chris. What up, James? It's a million James. This is James Smith. Is this Smitty? Uh, what up? Uh, what up? Uh, Orange County Condros. Uh, I think we were following each other for a minute, man. I, I like what you got going on over this. It's, it's nice. It's, it's pleasant on the eyes, and my eyes are shitty, so I appreciate it. Um, I have nothing to add to this week as far as anything going on. I got jury duty. I've been trying to get out of it with every lie I could probably put up about protection, protect this country. It don't seem like it's working. And I'm going to have to take my ass down to that courthouse and pretend to give a fuck. Um, uh, what's up, Dimitri? Uh, Dimitri, I guess that's you. Art of, the, art of, art of, of Condros. That's Dimitri. He finally has a, a, a name instead of Dimitri Dronis. Um, let me get some stickers when you got them, man. I need them shits. Uh, Mikey Marsh, how's how's your eggs doing, man? Uh, yeah, man, I'm just I'm just stalling until Kino shows up. I could tell y'all an unrelated story that has nothing to do with snakes. If y'all want to hear something like that, uh, James, I gotta talk to you because I haven't talked to you in a minute. Uh, it's been a long time. I need to talk to you. Uh, but let me know. Um, Besides that, my kids, you know, they get on my nerves. How'd y'all feel about the clip? And uh, it was not successful at all. So I wasted my time. I could actually watch the clips and, uh, you know, said I watched the clips, you know. And nobody would have gave a fuck. Nobody gives a fuck, man, honestly. I think that some of y'all thought that we were going to have, you know, a full-on... Um, apocalypse because that's what um the youtube prophets tell you every time something happens uh what's up carly uh every time we have something like this they always tell you we're gonna have you know an apocalypse and everybody's gonna die but i want to say man if you under 40 in america you didn't live through like a good 50 like apocalypses at least apocalypses that they said was gonna occur uh according to YouTube. Like, we just keep on surviving um, and thriving. Uh, you know, some of y'all some of y'all doing it the best y'all can, whatever issues y'all got going on in your lives. But yeah, man, shout out to uh, 
millennials and Gen Zers, man. We just keep on surviving all this shit that um basically unhinged people don't take their meds and get on YouTube. Uh, we know they can't do. I saw a dude talk about how he killed Anton LaVey yesterday by removing a demon from his spirit or some shit. Just a whole bunch of crazy shit on there. Um, I really don't got nothing else for y'all, man. I'm just waiting for Keno to show up. Um, I know he's dragging his feet because they move real weird, and he's dragging them the best that uh, that he can. Um, probably up some stairs with them kids. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, anybody got some projects going on that, you know, showing, you know, some, um, showing some promise. I like hearing about that. Uh, I like, I like seeing, you know, people get to the point of, uh, you know, creating new things. One of the things that, 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 you know, I'll probably get some flack for, I'll tell y'all it is, I'll probably get some flack for, it. uh, I'm not a, a guy that's big on lineage. I like seeing so, uh, and I, I, I want people to create their own. Somebody telling me that they got, you know, some stuff from old. That's the, the You know, look and how you expect it to look. Uh, um, so I like seeing the new projects. I want to see what Mikey Marsh has going on. He's got in the basement, Maiden or something crazy like that. Uh, I wait to see people. People who haven't done anything as far as breeding yet. I, I want to see. No, I think it's probably me. It says something weird. Is it still glitching? If it's still glitching, let me know. Uh, but I, I, I want to see people, you know, um, I want to see people that haven't bred bre breed. Like, that's one of my favorite things to see. Uh, you know, it, it seems like a lot of people, they have the ability to do it now, which is a wonderful thing. Um, even though we're coming at a time when you know we have less imports being brought in, I think that with the new breeders coming into the game right now, y'all can make up for that. Uh, Kino just sent me some text message. I hope he get his uh, fucking slop foot ass on here on camera pretty soon. Uh, I did take a shower today, so my ass isn't crusty. Uh, Carly and Lupe, I want y'all to know that it's clean um, with, with the finest of $10 bars of soaps. Uh, <laughs> What's up, James Mashi? Uh, What's up, motherfucker? What is going on? You own now. You own now. Thanks for finally getting your ass in on here 10 minutes late. Hey, look. Hey, look. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I said, better late than never. Time is of yeah. time. I said time is of the essence where we should spend it together. Yeah, you said five minutes, dog. Your five minutes is like my five minutes. It's not supposed to work that way. Only one of us. So I ain't play. no both. I ain't no both my kids in the back sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, did you have to pick up Khalil? I was there with Khalil practice, bro. Oh, you talking about carry him upstairs? Hell no, bro. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's like 140 <laughs> pounds. Like, dog. I'm, I, I thought am, you were strong, bro. though, bro. I I'm thought damn, you were strong, bro. Well, I'm, I'm not just going to drag 140 pounds around just because I'm strong. <laughs> is my is my camera part glitchy? Mm, no, not to my... No. Okay. She says I'm glitchy. If I got to call up, if I got to leave and come back in and I will... Who all up in here? Hey, freaking no. Let me see your time. Trey's my CJ, what up? Let me see. <laughs> What's up, Chris? Mikey Marsh? Tyler? What's going on, Trey? 
All right, man. You got you got anything yeah. you want to get off your chest before we bring Dimitri. in the legendary buddy Bushi? Um, do not want to get anything on my chest? I want to take this over because I was out there to do my coach on. Um, man, um, it's been a good week. <laughs> Uh, that's my little that's no fucking cap, man. That's <laughs> stupid. That's a um, that's a koofy, bro. <laughs> nah, bro. This is no. sporty koofy. That's sporty koofy. <laughs> stupid. Um, no, nah, man, it's been a good week, man. man. <laughs> you an idiot. Good week, man. I got the side of feeding the babies. <laughs> but this is Cyclops. So I feed and trials with them. Um, <laughs> strong like bull. <laughs> um, but no, man, I had to, um, let's see, the, the babies, are, they, they shed out, getting them established, man. It's been a cool week. We are finally getting some good weather here in Chicago, so. Can't complain, man. What you got going on? What happened to you? I ain't got nothing going on. I'm just trying to get out of jury duty. I got to be it on Thursday. And it sucks because that's also my birthday, and I really don't want to go. See, so, so really how go. I got a jury duty is um, I had jury duty, like, last year, but I wrote a letter, right, and told them that I was a single father, and that I couldn't find a, uh, <laughs> I couldn't find a daycare or nobody watched my kids, so. Did you send him a picture like Will Smith in that movie, uh, The Pursuit of Happiness, with one tear coming out of your eye? Nah, it was like uh, <laughs> it was the Will Smith Fresh Fresh Prince of Bel Air episode when he looked around, and nobody was there. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say the episode where he realized his dad didn't love him. Why don't nobody? Yeah, that's the same him? one. Yeah. No, that wasn't He's the same like, episode. I thought that was. And he was like, "My dad don't love me no more." Yeah, but that wasn't the same. The, the episode where he looked around and nothing was in there. That was the last episode. What's up? What happened to Silas? I don't know what happened to Silas. Why are you sitting there like a grown up? Go get your brother, take him downstairs. He's not guilty. Wait, why are you saying not guilty? Exactly. He went pissed. All right, man. You ready to go? Thanks, Diddy. Uh, yeah, let's, let's talk to Buddy Machini. Buddy, we're about to introduce a legend. Half man, of the so GTP Keeper like Radio. Stuff. Half of GTP Keeper Radio. Half of just being, you know, a great conjure legend. Um, and we're we about to bring him on, man. Let's go. What's, what's going on, Mr. Bushimi? What's up, buddy Bushimi? Yeah. This is it. Hanging out with you guys on a Tuesday night talking about Condros. Hey, what's going to be a good time tonight? Buddy, we um, hadn't talked to a serial killer in a few episodes. So. <laughs> don't 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 listen to this, this buddy. This is this is his nonsense. <laughs> listen. Listen, don't listen to this man at all. He thinks that most people are serial killers. He said that I look like a criminal at one point in time. Yeah, um, well, you know. We I mean, all, all might have it in us. Who knows, right? I mean, <laughs> Kino especially. See, hey, he the first one. Buddy is the first one that didn't. That, 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 uh, he's like, hey, we all have it in us. So, I don't know how to treat yeah. lightly around Buddy now. I see him at the show. I'm like, hey, Mr. Buddy, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> buddy, don't buddy, don't let him come at you like that, man. Just because you got on a fishing hat, don't listen to this man. <laughs> um, so, buddy, uh, could you give us a quick bio about yourself, and then we get into the to the proceedings this evening? Sure. Um, like most people, I uh, started keeping snakes as a young child, uh, running around an urban area collecting snakes, and eventually, when I, uh, I guess. Moved into adulthood and had some money. I started uh, purchasing animals that you couldn't normally find in uh, the local pet shops. In the uh, late 80s, early 90s, I had a collection of Liasis, Antaresia, Morelia. Um, and I spent the better part of the 90s of breeding those animals and spending a couple weekends every month going to uh, traveling to reptile shows. Um, and uh, after about a decade of that, I I moved away from that collection pretty much uh, I had sold everything um, except for some equipment and um, I picked up my first chondro in 2003 and that was it as far as chondros and okay. uh, you know I kind of had 
at that point in 2003, really, uh, 2001, two, I'd kind of sworn off breeding reptiles and, and going to shows and vending and, and, you know, just being in that grind of having to travel regularly to get your name out there in order to, if you wanted to sell snakes, you had to go to the shows regularly. And, um, so, uh, you know, I approached condor keeping as this is this going to be a single animal kept in a very nice enclosure that's going to be uh, kind of a, a focal point of one of the rooms in my house. And mm. uh, it didn't take long for that to change, as anyone who keeps condors knows, right? Um, yeah. like that changes drug. quickly. Like a bad drug, <laughs> real bad. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, so and that's it. And I've had condor since 2003 and I, I still have them to this day. Uh, they've been my primary focus since then. I've dabbled in a couple other species um, while I've kept chondros. Um, but really, uh, green tree pythons are the longest uh, uh, group of animals that I've worked with uh, in my entire uh, span of keeping reptiles and breeding them. Okay. Hey, buddy, where are you from? I, was about um, I am from Baltimore, Maryland. Oh, shit. Hey, I used to live in Hellthorpe. Okay. My wife uh, grew up, my wife, I grew up in the southwest side of Baltimore City. Um, and my wife grew up in Arbutus, which is right close to Hellthorpe. And I actually, yeah, my first apartment I rented was in Hellthorpe. So not far yeah, from me, so at, not far from me at all at the time. So they, I used to get my mail. So like my street was actually in Arbutus. So some of my mail would actually say Arbutus and some of mm -hmm. it would say Hellthorpe. It was weird. I didn't understand it at all. <laughs> but yeah, I used to get yeah. mail that came, from, that, that came from two different towns. But yeah, I, uh, I enjoy Arbutus a lot, even though it was about the size of a, of a, of a fist. Uh, it, was, yeah. it was a nice place to live for about a year and a half. Right. I, I liked it. I spent a lot of my uh, childhood running around those neighborhoods. Uh, great snake hunting in that area. If you got into that kind of stuff, there was a state park nearby where yeah, you could find uh, East. Yep. Yeah, Eastern King snakes. It. Yep. Yep. You can find some Eastern King snakes there if you looked. Um, and then, uh, and so, I, you know, I, I spent some time in the military, so I didn't have my entire life in Baltimore City. Um, but eventually as an adult, I moved back and, um, lived there for a while. And then, uh, in 2002, my wife and I, we relocated and we're now, we're about a 50 minute drive North of Baltimore, just South of the Pennsylvania line. So almost in Pennsylvania, Maryland is what I call it. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know where that is. That's Amish country <laughs> over there. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Did you ever get a chance to go to the, uh, the Guinness factory right outside? Of yes. Arbutus? Yeah, I used to yeah, see yes, it when I, I would run in the morning. Yes. Yep, been there a few times. <laughs> Keto, cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let's get to it, buddy. So so when you first got into chondros, what was the climate like? Did you uh, – and, and how did you get your first chondro? Uh, I acquired my first chondro <clears> – <throat> Uh, well, let's take a step back. Um, I, I I believe you guys had Tim Morris on the show. Uh, Tim Morris yeah. and I have been friends for a very long time. We actually met through a different hobby. We were both uh, avid mountain bikers in the late 80s. And um, we we met through mountain biking and just through conversations. Um, we discovered we both kept uh, reptiles and were attempting to breed them at the time. And so Tim was my first... Uh, for the first time I'd seen green tree pythons in, an, in a private collection that were captive, born and bred. And um, so that was really my first introduction. And then, you know, I was kind of uh, able to observe some chondro history happen. So uh, when Tim produced Mr. Blue, um, I, I was there when, you know, that clutch, Tim was incubating that clutch and when he established those babies. I was there when he was establishing those babies. And then right. when he actually took those snakes and put them on a table to vend at a show, because we, Tim and I would switch uh, tables at shows together. Um, Mr. Blue was on that table as a neonate. And uh, one of the things I could have done was bought that snake as a neonate, but I didn't because I didn't really believe in myself as a keeper. And I was 
uh, fearful of, of failure. Um, so when it came time, I decided. How much, uh, how much did years, he have for at the time? Uh, I'm sorry? How much was he asking for it at the time? I think he might have had it for like a $1,500 or $2,000, I think. Um, and I think he had the uh, the siblings were like about a $1,000 on the table and he had that one priced differently because the pattern was more reduced um so yep so i i i witnessed that um and, and that error so that error was the really the, the beginning of what we would call the designer green tree python phase and also the beginning of uh import locality animals coming in from indonesia biox and aruz and some job horror types um, so I was there to kind of be a witness to that. And again, so two, 2003, I, um, you know, Tim had known that I, what my intentions were with my collection. So when I had sold him, I was like, I think I just want to get a Chondro. Um, and Tim really, uh, even though he's really known for Mr. Blue, Tim's never been really a Chondro, what he would call a Chondro specialist. He has kept everything and it, anywhere from tortoises to blue tongue skinks he, he's been all over the place with his reptile collection um and so when i was looking for a chondro he didn't have any available so he pointed me in direction to another person in maryland who had um some animals that were brought in from bushmaster that were now adults that he was selling so i picked up a uh job horror type uh male and put it in a display cage and that was in 2003 and um Things just progress from there, as you guys know. Uh, that's how it goes with chondros, right? Yeah. yeah. I think you only want one or two, but like the, the urge to have more is is pretty strong and hard to resist. Yeah, one one crack rock turns to your whole house it's just <laughs> like that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So yeah, uh, when, when localities first started coming in, what was the most widely available, and what was yeah. the, the was was the was the hardest to to get your hands on? Oh, the hardest. Um, well, to be honest with you, with you, I really wasn't purchasing when they first started coming in, but I was I was vending shows with uh, my animals, and I also, like I said, Tim would vend shows with me, so. I was kind of aware of animals coming in, but Biak were still probably, and back then were the, probably the number one imported animal, um, followed by a ruse. Um, and then, and then it was a little while longer in the early two thousands. Um, when I started getting in the chondros, we started to see things like, uh, Bocadini localities, Wilmena, Cyclops. Um, and so, and different other, localities um some some of which we weren't even sure if they were true localities um or if they were just they look different people were just calling them different names and then um not long after that uh the kofi owls or the canary island con green tree green tree pythons came in and they were very controversial because they were, a lot of the adults were yellow and um there were quite a few high yellow projects in the designer community at that time. Lemon trees uh, were, were one. And um, I'm trying to think if Rob Rawls line was established at that point. So there was a lot of... Uh, by, uh, by that time, it, it, I think it was. Right. Yeah. So there was a lot of uh, you know, challenges to the canary chondros if they would stay yellow and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So... Um, and then some localities just kind of disappeared. I can't remember the last time I've seen a Womana Chondro or a Bocadini Chondro or, you know, Manaquaris have been around for a long time. They seem to be pretty consistent, assuming they're the same locality of animals that they came in 20 years ago that they are now, you know, no one can really say for certain. Right. Okay. So, so when you were getting... <clears throat> so, so you say that you weren't really looking at the, the the locality animals. So, what animals were you trying to get in, and you know, what was your end goal with the animals you were trying to get in when you initially started looking to create your own projects? Right. So, um, well, I like locality animals. I still like them to this day. Um, and Greg Maxwell was very big on the scene at that time. Uh, Maryland at that time was a uh, had a, quite a few people that were 
working with designer condros. For yeah. instance, there was Paul August. Uh, he was doing Maryland custom cages. He's who I, I acquired my first condro from. Um, we had a uh, Mark Spitaro in the area. Um, and, uh, the, the Sean and Christian Stewart were in the area. So there were a lot of people in the area that work with designers. Um, but my, so I was, I moved slow. I, my second animal was actually given to me, um, from a friend of mine who, uh, came to my house, saw my first chondro, decided to go buy a chondro, wound up getting, uh, a fast one pulled on him, told he was buying a, a, a a blue designer chondro from some unknown German line. And it turned out to be a, a wild caught mainland type um, that was uh, completely riddled with internal parasites. And um, he, he took the animal to the vet and the vet prescribed medication. The animal had a reaction to the medication. He assumed that he had killed the animal. Um, and he was pretty much, it was freezer bound. And I asked him if I could try to save the animal. So I saved the animal. So that was my second chondro. And then uh, my third and fourth animals were uh, a red neonate biak and a yellow neonate biak from Harlem Wall. And then I, then I picked up a des designer, my, my fifth animal. And my last animal for a long time was a designer animal from uh, Bob Kelly out of New York. It had a lot of uh, trooper wash blood in it. And so... I just sat with those five animals for several years and I just focused on uh, breeding and, you know, making my own baby snakes. That, that's really, really has ultimately been my goal with my collection, even when prior to Condros was to, uh, in order to ensure good quality control, I wanted to make sure I knew where all my animals had come from. And I, and so, and the best way to do that is to make your own animals and have your own breeding stock. Yeah. And um, as things progress with breeding through trades or selling snakes and raising money for other snakes, I purchased other animals. And um, uh, when the Bushmaster New Blue Animals came in, I, I acquired some of those animals. Um, I had some people that wanted to do breeding loans with me. Breeding loans were a big thing. Um, so yeah. I did some breeding loans with people. And the, I was able to bring in different bloodlines like um, Calico line animals, uh, lemon tree animals, um, and, uh, Versace animals. So, so that's really how my collection grew. And I tried to, like I said, I tried to go slow with it. I didn't want to, I, I'd, I'd also seen people who had come quickly into the condor community and acquire 30 or 40 animals. And within a year or two, um, they were just having, uh, problems with the collection. And so, Either they would have a massive die off or they would just things weren't going the way they had expected with their own personal goals. And they would just, you know, completely dump a collection onto uh, the market. So I, I you know, yeah. just looked at what those folks were doing and I just wanted to move slowly and with the goals in mind. So, you know, that's kind of how I approach so, things. So that's so smart. You, I mean, uh, you want to go and then I'll go. No, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. So, you know, in the last few years, like it, it was kind of a thing for a while where we would see huge collections being sold off to one person or big chunks of it being sold off. Yeah. And what we found out at that point in time, that was a bunch of NIDO with that stuff. But from your perspective, how many people have you seen come try to make the big investment, get all the chondros and it just not work out for them? Because to me, it seems like. I don't know how that does work out for somebody because keeping chondros, you really gotta you gotta become a real serious keeper first before you're gonna just invest and get a bunch of them and think it's gonna right. go well. So I just want to know your perspective on it. Um, so from what I observe have observed personally, usually it does. There's not a good outcome. Um, the collection either suffers the. The person is either acquired in a collection and they maybe have had a little bit of chondro experience. And so going from having, you know, maybe two to three young chondros to now having 40 adults um, changes, thing, uh, changes things up a bit. And we know adults don't really seem to acclimate too well, being moved around too much. So um, I've seen that quite happen quite right. regularly. I've also seen people come in. I mean, there, there are some people that have come in that have 
have clearly stated their goals and what they want to do. And, and th- having those goals are great, but a lot of times they've only focused on the end goal, which is I'm going to make a lot of money breeding chondros. And th- as you guys know, mm. um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of small goals that need to be achieved before yeah. you can, I mean, you could have that goal and you can state that goal, but, you, you have to understand how are you going to get there yeah, and why you want to do that. that gospel tonight, man. <laughs> that's real. That's that's real. That's the gospel, bro. That's what that's we 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 hammer that home, buddy. We it's almost like we're a broken record because we talk about that, and then we've had some people like stop talking to us because to be frank, man, you just be bluntly honest with people, like you know right. exactly what you said and. <laughs> we done lost some friendships because of that. Because it's just <laughs> like, like, dog, no. <laughs> Go ahead. To right, be, you know, well, a lot of times, yeah, that, a lot I of mean, times, that, like, because you, you'll get people too, is instead of getting a couple um, babies and then raising them, then getting 40 adults, what you'll get is people who will get adults and they have never raised GTPs from babies. So then. They go into panic mode because they know nothing about the animal. All they know is what the person that, you know, sold it to them seven months ago is all they know. Right. Um, and I'm sure you guys probably have seen this as well. You you will have people approach you and say, you know, I want to buy this snake from you. Um, and, and when you talk to them, well, what are your intentions? what do you intend to do with this snake? You know, if I sell you this seven year old female that I've raised since a hatchling, it's only been in my collection. What are your intentions? And, and if you hear the, if, uh, usually the intentions are, I'm, I, I would like to breed them this year. And, you know, to me, that just sends up a red flag saying, you, you know, you don't really understand how delicate these animals truly can be. Even, you know, older animals, uh, to bring an animal in and try to breed it uh, quickly uh, without giving it a proper time to be established, a year or two um, to be into your collection to be established. You know, usually I'm, and usually I tell people, you know, no, I'm not going to do that to one of my animals. Um, and if I were to sell it to you, I'll, I'll put a crazy price tag on it. So, but it's, it's, you know, it, it I think people see, and I, and I really don't know if it's, because I can't say it's a social media thing, but I think people really see focus on they see people doing really well, which is a good thing to see people do really well, because that's I mean, ultimately, I know you guys want to see people do well. And I, I want to see right. people do well with their collections, too. I mean, regardless of whatever species you work with, whatever your passion is, if, you know, I want you to, right. to, to reach your goals and, and do what you want to do. But there's a lot of learning involved. There's a lot of heartbreak and there's a lot of setbacks. and Sometimes people aren't prepared to uh, experience those setbacks, and sometimes they don't know how to move forward from from those setbacks. And so um, that's when you really, it's when I have relied most heavily on my snake friends. Um, when you have these bad experiences, right? Um, you know, you know who your true friends are when you can go to them and say, "Man, I screwed up. This is what no. I did. This is my mistake. This is my error." Um, and you know. Sometimes you just need somebody to be there and listen to you talk it out so you can not make the same mistake in the future, right? Yeah. Be there for each other. Yeah. I think that with Kondro, the first class. <laughs> But I knew he was gonna get he's gonna be all right. He was gonna be all right. Oh, um, I think that the thing that, that I've noticed, and I don't know if you've noticed, is that Kondro seem to have a really irregular learning curve. And it's hard to tell somebody this thing that you want to do may not work out how you see it at all and at the end of it at the very end of it once you actually produce snakes they may not look like anything that you even remotely imagined (laughs) so you to me it's just like you gotta learn how to love these snakes and want to have these snakes if you don't already love them and I think that's something that you can't get people to do. You gotta want to keep chondros. You gotta love chondros. You gotta see the beauty in chondros you gotta before be, you, you just gotta like be a I'm gonna first. make a bunch of money off of. Them. You gotta, you gotta be really first. be a keeper first. You gotta want to say, "Hey, man, I got these snakes. If they don't ever breed, they're good here." Um, 
and, and if you do breathe them, you got to realize like you are just continuing on keeping and you're going to have to refine a lot of things and actually become a better keeper to establish babies and raise them up to, to animals that you can actually sell to other people. Um, Correct. I think that's a difficult thing for a lot of people to conceive because they say, oh, colorful snakes makes lots of money. And it just doesn't work out that way in a lot of right. cases. Right. People, they don't have the one thing that you need with green trees. Patience. <laughs> Patience. Yeah. <laughs> Patience, and you also need to have the ability to be reflective in your practice enough to see where maybe you're making a, about to make a, a bad choice or a bad decision, yeah. uh, or when you've made that bad choice or bad decision, be reflective enough to understand that you've made a mistake and that mistake is yours to own, um, and you're not going to grow and move forward you know, as a keeper and, and as a person, um, and, and unless you accept that and, and realize it, I know, um, you know, when I first started keeping chondros, the husbandry standard was much different than how I keep them now. And, um, you know, 90, 92 degree hot spots. Yeah. you know, I, I, you know, I, I sprayed multiple times a day, large meal, frequent large meals, um, and it was, uh, you know, I, I struggled with some animals in my collection. I had some animals that didn't face, but I had other animals that I struggled with. And I, you know, prior to condors, I had never really struggled with keeping animals healthy. And, um, you know, I could have continued down that pathway, but as luck had it, I listened to a, uh, a reptile podcast and I heard about another keeper who was doing things differently. And so I had to muster all the courage I could inside of me to attempt to change my husbandry practices. And it's been for the better. Um, but yeah. it takes it takes courage and the ability to understand that maybe what you're doing isn't the correct thing um, that we would. So, and sometimes we want to believe it's always the correct thing. But that, you know, we're, we're dealing with live live animals, living creatures. Um, and, you know, it's easy to simplify things with these animals when really they can be complex and a challenge. Yeah. How did you, I, I um, think that that's true. How did you, uh, from your first conjo to the second one that was given to you, to your, your five, uh, how did you see being a keeper personally grow from your first to five? I got a follow up question to that too. Sure. Um, well, so, Really, I will say I didn't have much growth with those first five animals because um, I was I had kept uh, a couple of species. I, like I said, some other python species. I kept jungle carpets and bred jungle carpets for close to a decade. And uh, I kind of approached their husbandry as though they were jungle carpets. Um, and so other than keeping them in a cage with um, more uh, vertical space, I was really keeping them like jungle carpets. I think that was really a detriment to the animals. Um, one of the things I did have to change quickly, though, is I realized that um, frequent uh, water changes were, were more important to these animals than the carpet pythons and the liasis species and the antaricea that I were keeping. It was, you know, uh, every other day, every third day, doing water, water ball changes. I noticed a big change in my animals um for the better when i did that so so yeah those first five animals um i'm surprised they lived as long as they did um <laughs> because uh, i had the mindset that i kind of knew it everything at that point i mean i was still i was learning i was willing to learn i spent a lot of time reading I spent a lot of time on the uh, morelia viridis forum and great maxwell's forum trying to learn as much as i could about these animals and how they were different um but you know you have to want to learn and you have to and you have to want to change and those first five animals were kind of the you know the, somehow they survived and it wasn't really due to my experience as a keeper i think it might have been just due to the luck and hardiness of those particular animals it probably wasn't until close to a decade where i really like was like okay the snake is doing this for this reason um and you know i need to change certain things up um 
So, you know, and Ryan, you know, there's Ryan Young um, is he's shout always out to, Ryan. shout to Ryan. Ryan's always been one of those guys that um, no matter how people were doing things, at least back when I first started and for about a decade afterwards, um, Ryan did everything differently, he did everything oppositely. And he, you know, the exact opposite. You know, he didn't have these, well, you know, very warm hot spots and wasn't doing these heavy misting regimes and he was having if success. You ever meet Ryan in, if you ever meet Ryan in person, there's two things you're going to realize about him. He's a very tall guy and he looks like he has a real hard head. So it doesn't look like he's going to listen to anything that anybody says. It doesn't look, it doesn't seem like that at all. Right. Right. But you know what though, he's impressionable. It's easy to like <laughs> follow him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. He like, yeah. So, he, he's talking to him. He's like, yeah, it's, that that do make sense. I maybe I should go jump off that bridge. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Ryan, uh, uh, buddy. What's I got a question Ryan? for you. Sure. So, so you've been doing this for a long time, and. Um, about your uh, really hot hot spots, and oh, this is exactly. something that we we're going to go into. What are some of the major changes in husbandry that you've made over the past 25, 20 years plus? Like, what are some things that you've changed over the years that you realized you had to change them to go forward? Sure. So, um, it was a, really three main things that I did. Um, so I had my cages set up with the very warm hot spots and I had my cages set up where the heat panel was off to either the left or the right side of the cage. And so the rest of the cage was a cool area. Um, I was using mulch as a substrate. I misted multiple times a day. And uh, as soon as my animals were big enough, I fed them rats. So as soon as my neonates were big enough to take um a pink rat they were on it so um so the first thing i did was i shifted to a uh all mouse diet but that has recently changed again too and we can talk about that as as the whys for that as well so yeah, i shifted we gotta, to an we all mouse about that. we got we got yep, come back to that. sure we'll come we'll come back to it so i shifted to an all mouse diet um, and I decided that I didn't want the, the really warm hot spots. Now where I keep my animals, and this is a big thing too. A lot of people don't understand is, um, where you keep your animals and where you are located geographically does affect how your husbandry practices, right? So yeah, I live on the East coast. Um, and you know, living on the East coast, you know, humidity here is, can, is pretty decent. Um, yeah, in Maryland it is. Even in the summertime, it's it's actually Maryland's one of the most comfortable places I lived in my <laughs> life. I can't believe my wife hated it, but I love Maryland. And uh, come back. <laughs> I can't. My wife is a South Texas girl. She ain't coming gotcha. back. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> um, so uh so that was the first change was the the diet and then um, so my, my snakes are in the, the basement of my house. It is heated down there, but I have a poured concrete floor. It's unfinished. Um, so the temperatures down there are about it's 70 cool. degrees. So it's relatively cool. So in order to overcome the coolness, um, you know, you had to use those really hot, hot, hot areas, hot spots. Um, and I used radiate heat panels. Though initially when I started doing chondros, I did, I did the red light bulb, heat bulb lamp things. Uh, but when I moved to heat panels, so I shifted the heat panels from the uh, side of the cage to the middle of the cages. And I put the hot spot in the middle of the cages between 82 to 84 degrees. And so what I found was when I ran it that way, uh, no, no, no. the uh, the temperature was more even throughout the cage. So I didn't have to run that really hot spot. And so I took out the mulch. I stopped misting. Um, misting was probably the hardest thing to stop doing because that was such a habit every day to go down and miss the snakes. Um, and then before I would go to bed, I'd go down and miss the snakes. So it was a ritual that I built into keeping snakes. So that was hard to break. And I honestly thought 
and my my whole snake collection was just going to die because I wasn't missing them anymore. Okay. Um. <clears throat> so those are the big those are the big changes I made. So the the feeding, and I know Kino wants to get into that. I'm going to go downstairs and grab more beer. Kino, you work <laughs> you work on this because I know that you definitely want to talk mice and and rats the difference because that's just you just like that because you like cheese, man. <laughs> hey, so so first, uh, why the switch to mice? What what do you think that the uh, what what adverse effects do you think that the um, the rats rats initially was having on your uh, collection? So I saw no adverse effects on my collection. Okay. I had no prolapses feeding rats. My clutch sizes were larger. You know, talking, um, I had clutches close to 30. A couple of clutches close to 30, really? but mid 20s, okay. mid 20s was average with a rat. Um, but the reason I did that was I was concerned that not having that 90 or 92 degree hot spot that the animals wouldn't be able to properly digest a larger meal. Um, so that's why I switched to smaller animals. But we keep um, it cool. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that that was really the the reason behind it, um, and also so it's around I guess maybe two thousand six or seven or eight I can't remember I've ended a, a show and there was a whole bunch of us we had the Stewarts there Rob Warwell was there um, Ben Evans who was a conjurer breeder. Shout out to Rob. Ben Evans I remember that name too. Yeah, yeah you remember Ben Evans GTP fan? Yep. Ben Evans, how'd you, Rob how, Kelly. How'd you keep Rob from going on rants? Rob <laughs> Morrell. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, look, Rob's, Rob, 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 I will, I will give Rob this compliment. Rob knows what he's doing. Um, I, I do believe I he is a, a opinionated. Certain, he's biased. I won't say opinion. He's biased towards certain to the things. To highest degree. His, Right. And his bias, I think, is kind of he can't see that bias, which I think most of us have that problem. We can't see our own biases. Um, but I've never had a problem with Rob personally. Um, yeah, he, and also Rico was yeah, there and Cooper Walsh were there. So, you know, Rico was just, Rico was next to me and I had conjurers for sale. And, you know, he was like, how are those babies? I'm like, oh, you know, they're eight months old. And he's like show me the snakes on his table that are like a year and a half or a year old. And they're like, my animals are double the size. So it's definitely overfeeding these animals for sure. So, um, so, you know, it was just, a, uh, I wanted to, and I, at, at the time I would have, um, so I had these large, I had this large collection of pythons. I'd never had a respiratory infection in any of those animals, never experienced a respiratory infection. So I kept green tree pythons. Um, and so once I made those changes, got rid of the misting, got rid of the high temperatures, I don't really think the feeding had too much to do with it. Maybe the mulch substrate, I can't say 100% certain, um, but my, my incidence of uh, snakes with illness dropped dramatically, and okay, so um, then, which, which is so a good then, thing. Okay. Yeah. Right. So then, so then what prompted the change back to rats? So um, I've been using the same rodent supplier for probably 20 years. And uh, he, I don't know, he, he's had problems with supplying me with the, I use extra large or jumbo, extra large jumbo mice that he sells me, which are a good size rodent. I mean, they're, you could probably look at them and say that they're pretty close to a small rat for sure. Um, he's had a hard time. Uh, supplying me with animals now he's calling them the same type of animal but size wise they're not so it looks more like a regular adult um and so instead of having to feed two or three of these at a I've time that too right yeah so i don't know if it's, we, i'm pretty sure we have different supplies but i've noticed that too i don't know if yeah if if the pandemic um kind of i guess put a rush on the road uh mm -hmm. the broken up uptick you know and like we need to get this because shit there was so many animals bought and then you know everybody was at right. home so i yeah. kind of think that may have something to do with it and 
we may have they may have like rush uh stunted rats growth <laughs> if that makes sense yeah. you know by rushing yeah them, rushing yeah them. and it, it could be yeah just i a, mean the sulfurs the sulfurs before the pandemic look closer to like small rats and then post pandemic every software i've seen has been small i i think in my area i think it's the demand um i think he's he's good at what he does and he has a good customer base and um i don't know i can't say where how things are in your area where you are but i mean reptile keeping where i am is very popular and you know people want to save money and so they they seek out the rodent breeders because they know that they can you know purchase the feeder animals quality feeder animals for less than what they would you know if they had to go to a, a pet store or something like that so yeah i think it could be the 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 demand being placed on the on the the rodent breeder to, to supply animals so anyway I've, I've started every once in a while feeding my uh adult females a small small rat every second or third feeding okay did you ever go to the the tropical fish place in Glen Burnie, Maryland? Yes, yes. Yeah, I used to always go. There. Yes, yep, yep. I, used, I actually, I, used to go I, I worked in that industry. Um, in my that that's actually how I was able to acquire some animals. I I worked for uh, there was a place in Towson, Maryland, yeah. and this company uh, installed reef tanks. In, in businesses in the in the area in the Baltimore area and um, a friend of mine owned it and he relied on his friends as employees and he didn't pay us much but uh, we would run down to these distributors down in Northern Virginia who would bring in reptiles too so sometimes I would you know find some animals down there that for my reptile collection so yeah yep yep I used to was go, a, always go there and get feeders yeah yep so i got another question for you about husbandry sure caging caging how has caging changed <laughs> for you over the years right um so initially so i kept my jungle carpets in the neodesha cubes i don't know if you're familiar with those they're like a tan colored neodesha cage uh, oh, had yeah. double per a lot of people who still keep chondros in them. So I had a bunch of those. The old school yellow. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Manila yellow looking. Yes. They look yep. like they're made out of like prosthetic leg yellow. Yeah. <laughs> they do look like prosthetic legs. <laughs> and, and, and they get, uh, they, they change color and get real brittle if they're exposed to too much heat. Exactly yeah, what they look like. Breaking, it's not breaking around there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So initially, I kept my chondros in those cages, and they worked well. Um, but then I wanted to move to heat panels, and um, so I went down the pathway of making my own cages. Um, and that was really essentially telling my father-in-law that I would like these cages to be this size and look this way. And I would kind of hand him tools, and he would do it for me. Um, so I did some hand handmade cages, and then. Uh, Eventually, I shifted to PVC style cages, Jim Sharphorn cages. Actually, I had just retired uh, my last of the Jim Sharphorn cages a month ago, the uh, the old style PVC cages. So I used PVC, PVC cages exclusively for many years. Um, Would you stop? Uh, hold on real quick. The Jim Sharphorn, you say you retired. Would you stop using them? You retired to soldiers? <laughs> I retired them. They were done. They were worn out. <laughs> <laughs> they were great i mean I, I th they were great cages for what they were um my only problem with pvc cages is that um in order to really seal them to keep them from leaking some of the products that you have to use and this is my little bit of my uh ocd concern is that a lot of the products that you actually could use to make them truly waterproof they do off gas for a little while, and I was always concerned that they might cause the snake some respiratory issues. So yeah. I would use this regular silicone, and that was a was a continual process of resealing the bottom of these cages. And then every every spring and fall, I would take all these cages outside because they would have eventually leak. So I would take the cages outside, and I would have to scrub the because I had them stacked. 
So I take them outside, I'd scrub them, bring them back in, do the same thing in the fall. And it, it, I just decided last year that I was done doing that with cages. Um, so I, I retired them. They're 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 sitting out in my own garage right now, uh, looking pretty sad. But they, I mean, they last a long time. They're about fifteen years old. That's a good time. They, yeah, they they did what they were supposed to do. Yeah, you got some money's worth. Yes, yes. Oh shit, that's rain. Yeah, it's it's yeah. Just um. So, would you change the cages over the years? Uh, what are some items that you you figured out over the years that you have actually used for you know these twenty years, like certain lights? Or do you do you use pro panel heat panels, pro panels heat panels, um, and things like that? Certain types of hooks, things like that. Um, so, cage lighting. I initially started with lights in all my cages, and eventually I took them all out. So I just rely on the ambient lighting of my snake area. Um, my sharp porn cages initially came in black PVC because that was, I guess, the cool thing to do. Um, but I actually prefer white PVC cages because the ambient light, 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 they just reflect the light back in. Um, so I, I, I took the cage lighting out. I don't use, uh, don't use in cage lighting. Um, I've used uh, mostly pro pro products, pro panels. I have tried the uh, heat panels that came from Reptile Basics. I have a couple of those. I've tried them. They work okay. Um, you know, I haven't had any w issues with them. And most recently, um, I, I have uh, some of the Willowbanks radiant heat panels. I uh, just started panels? using those. Yes, just started using those. Um, and they seem to work pretty well, you know, can't tell you how they, how they do, you know, with longevity and those type of things, but, you know, they, they seem to do pretty well putting the heat out and, you know, no, no concern so far for me on those. When you, um, okay. when you took your, uh, like all the, the fixed lighting and, and went to ambient, uh, when you first did that, did you have problems, um, with your animals like now? Not realizing, like you were just going in there to like change bowls, or yeah, okay, yeah. It, it... <laughs> I was about to say because yeah. I know that I know that like, I was hunting time. Yes, right? yes. But you was um, like, man, I should have put those lights back in there. Man. <laughs> <laughs> they initially they were like, okay, lights are out, so the cage is open, and we're we're going to be fed. So <laughs> I did. Like that that was a little bit time. of a, a change. So I had to. Uh, learned a couple of quick lessons there, um, but it, but I did notice that um, my snakes used to seem to always hide their heads with the lights in the cages. Um, I noticed without having the lights in the cages, they they didn't hide their heads as much, um, and they're definitely more. They were more inquisitive towards me when I was doing things as opposed to just kind of sitting there, not moving, hiding their heads. You know, they'll they would like you know. They weren't facing me. They would drop their heads down to look to see what I was doing in the cage and that type of stuff. So yeah, I agree. I've noticed that too. As I went to, I went from twelve to like twelve, twelve with the lights to fourteen, ten on, uh, fourteen off and ten on. Yeah, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of thinking about going to, like, you know, doing doing a sixteen and eight because hmm. this is a little bit more, just a little bit more spunk to them. Yeah. So I, I, think, I, I, I think that the the twelve and twelve works well. I do it with with daylight savings hour. So when it's supposed yeah. to be a lot of light, I do twelve and twelve. When it's the winter time, it's fourteen ten. And I I like hearing how everybody else does it. It's super. It, it's really interesting to to me to see how people regulate their light cycles and still see them able to get animals to breed and like how buddy does it he doesn't he doesn't use lights so yeah that's going to be the next four way four a four a it's gonna work four that's a. the next route four we're going into <laughs> four a yeah we're, that's, that's where we're going next we're talking about breed all right good night Way so with my lights i uh have a uh they're on a timer and so they the lights come on at dawn and go off at dusk so 
in the winter time they might be getting you know nine hours of light and summertime they're getting 15 hours of light so which you know in the winter time makes it challenging to sometimes get home from work to get into the snake room to do water changes before the lights go out or to clean stuff like that so it does make that does make it challenging um but that's how i've been doing things for a long probably maybe a decade or so i've been using that that type of light cycle yeah that makes a lot of sense i think a big ass piece of hell just hit one of my windows uh oh yeah it's texas. that's what it's like living in texas just big ass <laughs> pieces of hell breaking shit. And where are you in texas i live in san antonio Oh yeah, yeah. I spent yeah. some time in San Antonio. Yeah, my wife's family is like uh, from the Rio Grande Valley, so like by Brownsville. Yeah, that's big ass pieces of hell. Uh, <laughs> that's what that is. That's not like no, oh, damn. <laughs> so like, so like somebody throwing rocks in my window. No, that's hell, no. bro. That's Texas. It's like some bad ass kids. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's why we came back here. So my wife, she loves San Antonio. I love Maryland. Yeah, that's big. Yeah, she's gonna be mad as shit. There's gonna be some business in the car tomorrow. <laughs> 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 but um, but yeah, um I, I wanna get into breeding with you, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Because I would like to know over the years how you have gotten your your babies to the point where they're at now and what it took to get them there um over time and how'd you how you pick these projects to do over the years um so a lot of times so for the project sometimes the projects kind of picked me i'd have people reach out and say you know for instance i had uh christian stewart reach out and say i have one of the last pure lemon tree animals in my collection and I don't plan to breed him with anything. Would you like to try him for, you know, some pairing? Like, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then other things have been, well, so I like, I guess, take a step back. I really haven't met a conjurer that I don't like. Um, so I, I appreciate all types of chondros, even the wild types. Um, but for me, I like an animal that um is a, has you know a mostly blue animal with green highlights and big yellow diamonds i like that look so that's kind of what has driven me towards uh you know holding back animals and, and pairing animals and and trying to acquire animals that have a similar look um and so you know the first several clutches i was just happy i had babies and um, they were, you know, lo essentially locality animals. Um, and I just held them back knowing they would all be just normal green tree looking pythons and, um, and just went from there. And I, well, I, I learned a good lesson from Sean and Christian Stewart, which is um, high end males, mediocre females. Um, that, that seemed to be the, the bet, their route to success was really focusing on acquiring higher end males um, just because you know, males can give you multiple clutches in the season. So if you have a male and you really like the way that it looks and you're trying to replicate that look, you're able to, to breed that animal, um, you know, a couple times a year, maybe as opposed to a female where maybe you're breeding every other year or maybe two years and then take a year or two off. So uh, that's kind of how I approach those things. And, you know, I've I've had babies that I thought, wow, this is going to be an amazing adult. It's going to be, you know, high blue or high black, and they turn out to be green. And then I've had other animals that uh, look pretty nondescript and turned out to be amazing adults. So sometimes it is a lot of luck with, with picking out neonates. Um, you know, that's just it. I just tried to, you know, really tried to please my own self or what I like to keep and what, what animals are pleasing to me. And that's how I made, made my choices for what I, what I breed. Buddy. So what I wanted to ask you, uh, was why, cause you, you said, uh, how you basically, uh, your plan was to take, uh, like out extreme outstanding males to mediocre females. 
Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, yeah. Cause, cause I say, I, I, I mentioned that because you came along and like you cut your chops in a time where a lot of people was making like, they would put like the outstanding male to the outstanding female. Or you would get like sibling to sibling parents. Oh, why did you feel that the stewards was like, I guess for lack of a better term, doing things the right way by uh, by doing that? Yeah. So when you look at, uh, I mean, look at your look at females in general. They're, they they contribute most to the breeding project, right? I mean, the males the males they are doing his thing, and then that's it. You know, the female is uh, growing the follicles, shelling the eggs, laying the eggs. Um, if you do maternal incubation, she is incubating the eggs. You guys are, are breeders. You know how hard it is on a female just to have her go through a reproductive yeah. cycle where they're not yeah. um, incub- where they're not actually incubating eggs. So the chances of... Uh, Right. Want to come out? Yep. Or you know, a a be an egg bound. So the chances of a female having a complication during the reproductive cycle is, uh, it it it's much higher. I mean, males really don't have too many complications. So, I mean, I'm not saying you should never buy a high end female or keep a high end female and breed it. But when I was establishing my collection, I kind of followed that because you know a mediocre female uh with good genetics is gonna a less of a, a financial investment than the standout female from that clutch so you can acquire those genetics um, that's true and, that, that and, is and, true i give you that one. right yeah so you acquire the genetics and then um maybe you have a male that's a, a stellar male that has a similar genetics and so you know, chances are you're going to have a, a couple of stellar animals from that pairing. So that, so that, that was the thought process, um, at least back in, you know, 15 years ago along those lines. Um, and I, I you know, I, I, Christian Stewart, uh, I don't know whether he'll tell you that that philosophy is still his would be the same for him now today as well, but that's what it was back then. So, so then how did you cross over from um so you was working with the locality stuff and then right. you went heavy designers but then you start creeping in with like uh you start bringing in like new blue stuff bocandini or uh, slash remain and stuff because they right depends on yep. you're talking to that's basically the same yeah um, yep so then um i specifically mentioned them because i got a I, I I personally got a little fascination with the new blue project. Okay. And um, lemon tree too. I, I put it up there with the lemon tree because I I feel like the the new blue project when it came here, it was used as a as an outcross for the blue line stuff. Mm-hmm. But nobody really tried to like see what that new blue stuff would do by itself. I just felt like that's some untapped potential right there. I agree. Um, I wish that there were more animals that were had a strong Bushmash and New Blue background to kind of focus, be able to focus on those animals. I believe they were one was an hour fox and one was a Jaipur, if I'm correct. Yeah, that were that were blue animals, um, amazing yeah. looking animals for sure. Um, and just goes to show you that you know sometimes Mother Nature makes the best designers yeah. um, uh, of them all. So. I so when I acquire animals, I really just go by, I look at it and I decide I like it, um, and you know that's really my personal preference, um, and you know, I I I like the way that the Wobanas looked that had they carried the the mite phasing as adults, the the Bocadini and uh, Manaquari animals that I had was just an incredible looking male that I acquired. I mean, I bought the animal, uh, that animal, which is one of the last condors I actually bought about a decade ago. Um, I acquired it because uh, I saw the photo. I was like, wow, that snake looks amazing. Um, And and, um, it turned out when the snake came in, it actually looked better than the photo, which isn't always the case. Um, 
And it was yeah. and it was a great breeder. Oh, well, we know, we know. Right? You guys have probably you guys probably had that experience. Uh, yeah. And the and the snake was a great breeder as well. So that that was another upside to it. So um, that's important for me as well. You know, and and there's an, a male that I that that came from one of his pairings. It's a very, it's a high blue male, um, and and he he produced three clutches for me this year. So he's carried on dad's. Uh, dad's uh reputation of being able to get it done with the ladies um libido just like you you're a ladies yeah. man <laughs> <laughs> this is buddy the belt. <laughs> <laughs> uh. and so the same with the lemon tree like the lemon tree animal came in i produced one i was able to produce one clutch with the lemon tree um and that was a it, the female was a calico outcross female that uh was a calico animal that was crossed to a manaquari that was produced by vita cernak um and uh so the you know the only pairing i was able to get with the from the lemon tree male while he's here about six or seven years and um you know but they're you know another amazing amazing animals that uh have kind of been lost to you know, lost to the to the condor world. Um, uh, my understanding is that there are no pure lemon trees left. Not that I heard of it a lot. No, it's high yeah. percentages, but it's not no pures. Right. So and that was one of my favorite lines. Let's yeah, they're, they're big. And the, they're big animals. They are uh, the male I had was was well over a thousand grams. I have I have one of his sons and he's a he's about eight hundred grams, so they're they're big animals that they, they you know they're they're a, a big if you like larger chondros they're they're definitely a larger chondro for sure. That thick boy okay. love it. That's right. So I got a question for you, buddy. I want to sure. hear about your philosophy when it comes to. Baller dorsals on chondros and how to get it. So, what do you mean baller, by baller, baller, baller dorsals? dorsals. Yeah, yeah, what's that? He, he got, so, you're he, talking he about did, the diamonds? He, he diamonds? He put his affliction shirt on tonight. Okay. I wish I had it. Uh, Listen, if I had an affliction shirt with some rhinestones on it and a back little condo door loaded, I'd wear it everywhere <laughs> I would. <laughs> uh, about the diamonds on the dorsal and how and how that is one of the things that you work on to get. I, I, I so just looking at neonates, I would pick neonates that had the had the big had big diamonds, and they had to have either yellow or orange diamonds. So if they had white diamonds, I would like set them aside as maybe I'll keep them back. Um, but my experience has been the snakes with those yellowy diamonds as neonates or the orange diamonds. In my experience, they tend to give you those big diamonds for when the animals mature. Okay. And clean diamonds. I like the clean, like the clean diamond. There's no no muddiness inside of it or anything like that. Princess Diana diamonds. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So it's just really neonate right. selection. You know, picking them out, going for the bold pattern neonates, keeping them back, holding them back. Hopefully they look like you want them to. Um, and then incorporating them into a, uh, you know, trying to pair them with an animal that has uh, similar characteristics. Okay. So when you're picking, when you're picking holdbacks, buddy, uh how difficult is it you know how difficult do you make it on yourself <laughs> and inversely and, and how uh harshly are you deciding like to to base you know the criteria that you want to carry on and like how long do you hold neos back is it a certain time is it a certain time with just certain clutches um just could you go into that process for me Sure. And, and um, uh, how do you feel when you when you sell? Because you say you like to keep the best stock. Add on to that. How do you yeah. feel when you sell a Neo okay. and it turns out to be like real stellar? And you like, are you like, yeah, I'm glad they got that, or like, <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> 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 
A little of both. <laughs> um, so let's go back to the first part of the question, which was um, how do how do I hold how do I decide to hold back? Well, if I had my way, I would never sell a chondro. If I had my way, um, but one of the things I've always wanted to be able to do with my collection is I, I never wanted my collection. <laughs> <laughs> to be a to be a burden on my family financially, so um, I paid eight. So that that's the reality. Uh, okay. But I also keep a low overhead, so I don't feel like I need to sell a lot of snakes, which is a good thing too. Um, so so I look at um, so if I, let's let's just say um, I produce this male. I like the way he looks. I put him with a female. She's okay. Nothing, no, nothing to like, you know, write home about. Um, if I know what that male looks like as a baby, when those, when, when, if he's paired and the baby's hatched, I try to pick out the animals that look like the male, or vice versa. If the female is the st standout, and you knew what that animal looked like as a neonate, and you want more animals that look like that, I pick out those animals. If they're both kind of okay looking, then I start looking for heavy, heavily patterned animals and animals that are lightly patterned. So that that's kind of how I that's how I start, and then I go by feeding response. Sure. Um, I I want strong feeders. Um, I I I'm not a fan of assist feeding animals. I I I think there's enough chondros being produced in the in the states that you know we don't need to really rely on assist feeding on a regular basis i'm okay if you need to do it to get them a few meals into them and to get them established but for me personally if they don't eat they don't eat that's the way it's good that's the way it is and it could be the hottest looking neonate i have in my out of that clutch if they don't eat they don't eat that's how it is it's kind of cold-hearted but i want to make sure that um my animals are solid feeders. You know, you guys now we gotta, been we doing this well. What we got to walk that line though, because, like you said, um, it's cool to like produce a lot of nice stuff, but at what point are you putting like no shitty product out there? Right. As far as, as, far as eaters, I mean, you you get what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, so I absolutely. Get, I, get, I, I understand that. So, um, yeah, I look at it this way. Every snake that leaves my collection has my name on it, right? And so that that animal ultimately, whether you want to believe it or not, is a reflection of you. And if I'm, and I'm going to say that I have had animals here that have been amazing feeders that I've sent to people and they've been problems. Um, and so I, I won't say that, that that does not ever happen. Um, but I also have had uh, animals that have just not been great feeders. And so I, I keep them here. And usually I find somebody that wants a green tree python as a pet. And I, I make it happen for them with the understanding of I give no guarantees this animal is going to feed for you when you get it to your place. Um, but anyway, so that's that's what I'm doing, like feeding response. Um, if I like the way the, the adult looks and I know what they look like as a neonate, that's how I'm picking out those neonates. Yeah. Um, to and then a lot of quick, I think uh, uh, to, I want I want to go back to that, but to interject, I think that uh, I think as as I'm more like more reading and you know host these shows, when you I think the regional part plays something into that. Like what we what we mentioned earlier, how if you send say you in Maryland, you send animal maybe to California. I I think naturally you gotta expect uh, maybe a, maybe a couple steps back. Sure. It's just it's there's no no different than say if I produce an animal here and I send it to Colorado. Just like how we adjust with our lungs into the, the altitude, I think we gotta mm -hmm. take that to consideration too regionally. Right. And I think times I mean we, we love these animals and we we want people to enjoy keeping them just as much as we do, right? Yeah. And I, but I think sometimes we may um not think about how easy we make it sound to keep these animals and that we may set an unrealistic expectations for new keepers that you know you're going to get an animal in and it's just gonna you know you know eat like gangbusters <clears throat> i think that um 
you know, there, there's it's a it's a really fine line to walk of having responsibility as a breeder towards a uh, customer, making sure their animal does well. But it's also there has to be some responsibility on the keeper as well, understanding that, um, you know, this is a living animal and there's no guarantees that, um, you know, that you, you might not have problems getting it to eat at your at your facility or your, you know, in your house that um and so that really is what you know i think we kind of simplify that like oh it's feeding great here it should great feed great for you here but there's always a caveat yeah. that you may have to reestablish a green tree python and there are there are people who are relatively new to keeping these animals that yeah. don't know what that means i mean you guys are breeders you guys know what it takes <laughs> to get these animals going and get them going regularly so yeah. You, yeah, yeah the two of you ass, probably. It, it does. It does. <laughs> um, you, you guys would probably, you know, not have a problem reestablishing uh, a chondro um, yeah. if it came in and like it was uh, a challenging feeder for you. Whereas somebody who has no experience, you know, they're they're going to struggle. They're going to struggle for a while, and then it comes yeah, down just... to the fact that, you know, you you know, I got this animal from you know Buddy Buscemi and. Oh, it's not feeding, and he told me it was, and you know, then you you know you go down that pathway of uh, you know the blame game, those type of things. No, so, when you find out that like you you spent two days trying to tell this person how to set this animal up, and then right. you ask for a picture of the enclosure, and <laughs> this big yeah. ass extravagant, yeah. this big ass extravagant thing, and I be like, uh. <laughs> Can you refer to the video that I made you? Like that ain't even my animal. And I, I made this video for you. And then you, you, as soon as you get that animal, you did it the exact opposite of what I said. You know right. one of the things about selling chondros to people that's crazy is like, especially when you sell it a chondro to somebody that's a new they first new one. Because I was guilty of it with my first new one. Their idea is that they're going to set this thing up and it's going to look like a wild jungle with the snake inside of it. And that from the keeper and the breeder standpoint, it's just like, no, absolutely don't do that. You need to set this thing up as clean as possible so you're not having any obstacles, anything you got to worry about the snake eating. For real. That's not the prey. You don't have to worry about any of that. And you need to be able to monitor this thing as it goes through quarantine. And they're just like, no. I've always wanted a mini jungle in my living room. <laughs> <Said> no. And, <laughs> it's, <laughs> and it's just difficult. It's just difficult yeah. telling somebody that. <laughs> it, it, it is. And it's, you know, I've, I've never really understood the mentality of, you know, you buy a steak from a breeder, they give you very specific instructions on how the animal should be set up and what you should do on your, you know, your first couple weeks or month with the animal. And all that advice is just completely ignored. And I need, um, I need to point we struggle. You to a very, I need to point you to a very special movie that explains that pretty well. It's called Gremlins. It explained <laughs> that very well. <laughs> but people don't listen. <laughs> yes. I had never thought of it in that aspect, but you are correct. Um, I can't remember if I answered all the neonate questions or not. Oh, how do I know they're established? I don't go by like a, a set rule of 10 meals or 15 meals. I go by their animal's behavior. So for me, so, you know, um, we all probably keep chondros the same exact way in the tub, all that stuff, right? Yeah, when I yeah. slide open that tub and that steak is almost out of the tub yeah. and it wants to eat, that's when I know that animal is truly established. That's the sign yeah. to me that this is an established animal. If, you know, if, if there's any tease feeding involved... <laughs> Or convincing to me in my mindset that animal is not established now having said that if you were to say hey buddy i really like that steak and uh, i'm like look it's it's you know not eating the way i'd like it to be but based on your personal experience 
with how you are with chondros and your experience with having breed, bred chondros and established babies, I would feel more comfortable sending them to a person like you than as, as opposed to someone who's brand new. I would never send an animal like that to someone who's brand new to, into chondros, period. Because I've never seen them go from timid feeder to rabid feeder. Um, it usually goes the other way. Yeah, and it, and and the stronger they are, the more likely they'll continue that on. But correct, you know, when I feel like they're established, it's like you go to feed one, and then like once you feed one, all of them come to the front. Like whoever comes to the front to eat, like you watch it scare straight, and then prisoners all come to the <laughs> gate and be like, "I fucking kill you, little boy!" Like that's how you know that like the yeah. other ones that are established. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. I agree. Yeah, and so and um, it depends really. Um, I've had clutches that I've that I just have held back for over a year, um, and I've had clutches where people wanted animals, and you know I had you know laid out money for caging and rodent bills and those kind of things, and I'm like, okay, I'm willing to sell some animals. So I really don't have like a set, like you know thing for how you know with a timeline for you know holding back animals i try i like to hold them back as long as possible just so i can start maybe seeing what the change what they're going to look like through the change um and also it just gives them a a, a stronger base for when they do leave of, of being established okay so i think you, you sound like you really take your time not only just to like see if, if 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 these are animals that you want, but you have all around you know process for establishing the babies where they go out. Um, how often do you feel like? Well, not really how often, but it's just an opinion. Do you feel like you need to do customer outreach? You know, like like to, to people that you sell these snakes to to check up on them, and like how much is that is really just like you spying to see if this animal. <laughs> turned out to be what you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question. If you don't want to yeah. answer that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I like to know exactly how all my animals are doing. Um, just in general, just because it's good feedback for me as well, because um, when I, I'll admit when I first started breeding chondros, like what I thought was established probably really wasn't an established animal. So it's good to get feedback. Like I'm struggling with this animal um and it, so it I, I appreciate getting that type of feedback and i want to know how things are going you know i sell snakes to some people and i never hear from them again and then a few uh, three or four years down the road they'll send me a picture of the snake on eggs or something like that and then i have people that you know they they picked the snake up for me and it's like they're you know like their third child so you know they're taking pictures every week and they tag me in the photos so I, I like knowing what's going on with my animals. I like to know if they, you know, just how they're doing, what they look like, and if they've been incorporated into a breeding program, how successful has that has that been for them? Do the people who tell you weekly annoy you? No, actually, they don't. Yeah. I, I I actually enjoy it. I just I, I so I really. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I do enjoy about social media is I do like looking at snake photos. Particularly, particularly chondros. Um, I have a couple other little snakes I would kind of like to peek at once in a while. They don't bother me at all. I like to see it. I like to know it. People send me updates. I like to. It's fun. I, it's fun to see it. To, to see that have that experience. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Since you like looking at the snake photos, I got a question for you because that is a question mm -hmm. for everybody, and it's not about snakes really. What does your Explorer page on Instagram look like? What type of pictures are you <laughs> trying to market to you to look at? Um, <laughs> well, so right now, because it's spring, and um, I go out and look, I do go out and do some field herping. Um, right now on my, so I have, I actually have several Instagram pages. Um, I do a lot of outdoor stuff. So I do a lot of backpacking, um, do a lot of outdoor skills. So I have a page, an Instagram page on that. So if you look at that right now, it's it's mostly like people backpacking, sharpening knives, um, guns, those type of things. But if you look at the, my GTP Keeper page, um, it's mostly chondros, 
Um, and right now, just because I'm also doing it as well, I'm seeing a lot of folks that go out and they actually go field herp and they share their experiences with what they're seeing in the right now in their their parts of the uh, country. Um, so a lot of that type of stuff. Would you like to yeah, know that was like mine? an explore. <laughs> Would you like to know what's on my page when I hit the search button? Don't sure. ask him. It's uh, it's gonna go said, left. Sure. Don't sure. ask him. Don't uh, ask him. <laughs> I get uh, pimps. <laughs> midgets <laughs> or little people. Uh, for you know, what I'm saying. Um, All right, this is officially going off the rails. And I get uh, <laughs> M and M's. M and M's. I like M and M's. It's not, oh, that's not what he's talking it. about. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking it. about little chocolate candies with hard shells. That's not <laughs> what he's talking about. I, am. <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I know you pretty well. Anyway, you what's sound like you have. Buddy, what's your favorite type of m and I like the almond ones. That's not. I love buddy, almond ones. That question. Yes. That's the not what he's almond. talking about. That's yep. not, he's not talking about candy. Because <laughs> I am. He's Eminem not is talking fire. about candy. <laughs> He's not talking about candy. Eminem is our fire, bro. The almond ones are fire. Those, those are my favorite ones. Yeah. Second, I think least, that peanut butter ones. I think that Keno likes the Eminems that are exceptionally slow. Um. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> yeah. yeah. Get out of here. <laughs> <My arm> with, <laughs> with your nonsense. This man has a wholesome. <laughs> Explorer page that any mother or grandmother would be proud of to look over their son's shoulder and see him looking at. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's not buddy, like your Explorer you, page. Buddy, I'm going to see you a couple of my videos. Explorer page. Don't, I'm going to see you a couple of videos buddy, that be popping up on me. Buddy, buddy, you don't want that. Listen, you sound like you got a good home <laughs> life. You don't want that on your phone, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not going to mess up his home life. What? It <laughs> might. Unless, I mean, unless he... He, he married to a dominatrix, then that's different. Okay, let me ask you a question, Keto. Do you think that, like me showing my wife the videos that you sent me is going to be good? Which one? <laughs> it depends. Which one? Anyway, some let's of the get stuff, back to some of the stuff is only for the, So some of the stuff is only gas stuff. So what you mean? Like some, you know, it depends. You know what I'm talking about. Just, 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 just stop. <laughs> Some stuff is gas. I mean, look, bro. Look, we don't bro, have you know to. We don't have. Listen, bro. Your listen, wife shouldn't be going to like, your phone checking checking your gas. She, my, my, she don't. She don't. You know what I'm <laughs> she, she don't. That's you why gotta we start. still friends. You gotta start. You gotta start. <laughs> 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 what the fuck? Everybody gotta start. Everybody gotta start. Hey, buddy, I got a question That's for ridiculous. you, man. Sure. <laughs> So as as far as things have gone with you expanding, you know, how you see designers, do you feel like you have at this point created your own line? Shut up, Chris. I don't think so. No, I think uh I mean I don't know what a line of stakes definite what that definition definition is today, but I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. I, I think it's you know, I, my collection is, uh, you know, based up of other people's lines, and uh, and I just play with them to see what what I can make. What's your favorite class that you? Uh, Would you, you have pushed it forward? I could, I would actually say that. What's my favorite clutch? That um, yeah. so far to date. <clears throat> well, that's a tough question. Well. Can I give you a couple of different answers? Give me a top three. <laughs> give you a top three. Well, my first clutch, right? That 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 was you know that was a you know a major. Uh, I thought a major achievement. Um, let's look back finally finally up, upon that. Um, <clears throat> favorite three in 2017. I did a Bushmaster New Blue to Calico Outcross. That was a pretty good clutch. Had a lot of there's a lot of good animals in that. Um, unfortunately, I didn't keep many of them. Uh, and um, 
The female that I did keep back from that clutch is going to be my third clutch, which is a, a, a pair of that female to a sickness offspring uh, last year. And so those, those are probably my top three favorite clutches. That's an Assyria? Yes. That's the yes. one of the animals that's, that's the animal that's on Morph Market right now? Uh, that's one of the babies that's on Morph Market, correct. Exactly. Yep. From that from that pairing. You know, you got that female is from that Bushmaster New Blue Calico Outcross pairing. Because you got people blowing me up like, why is this is like this? Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, buddy, I ain't going to lie. I think before they saw that snake, you was kind of known as like one of the guys, you know, who um, got decent prices. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But I think what people don't realize is that a lot of this, this blood and and I don't care what you say, Pat. The artifact animals that came in labeled as artifact, they still artifact, God damn it. I don't care about your, <laughs> about your artifact mountains being in the Manicry region, none of that. And the yeah. animals that can trace back to the original artifact animals, that bloodline can go right back there. I don't know. I think those animals hold value, in my opinion. Yeah. 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 That's, um, you know, contra prices really has exploded. Um, I, I, I mean, last year, I had animals in the $800 range as well for sale. Um, so for captive bred animals, they didn't last long. Um, and I still try to try to have animals yeah, you do. priced where I think, you know, um, not everybody's looking for a, a, an investment quality condor. There are people out there that want pets and they want pet condors that are good quality animals that are very solid. Um, and I don't think that they necessarily should have to rely on import the import market to meet their needs. Um, I mean, if you, if you look at the imports, um, the import prices right now for a lot of these animals are, are, I mean, I, I saw import animals that were double the price of my captive bred animals last year that, um, well, I was like, look, half dead, look, half dead. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so I, 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 you know, I, I still, um, and I, I've said this many times, I think that we oftentimes do a disservice to people who are interested in keeping green tree pythons. Um, you know, if you're looking for a green tree python and you came across that, that Syria animal on morph market, you would be, um, probably devastated that, that, that you thought that, that what it, that's what it would take to get into keeping a captive bred chondra, right? Um, and, uh, I really think, and, and I've I've tried to do this. I, I try to do this every year, is try to produce animals that are going to be at the entry uh, price point for keepers, um, because just you because you, you know just because you're starting out, um, like like I said just a few minutes ago, you should you should still have access to quality captive bred animals. You shouldn't have to rely on the import market, and I think that's a that's a failing on the condor community in general. I think if everyone were to just focus, you know, take some time and focus, you know, on some entry level animals, that's how you grow the hobby. That's how you get people enamored in these animals is you put an animal, you know, put an animal in their hand that they can afford and that they can afford to house appropriately. You know, we don't you know, a- you know the other thing is we don't want to, you know, it's hard to charge prices for an animal knowing that, you know, buy a chondro for a thousand dollars and if you want to get a really nice you know top quality cage you know that's another four hundred five hundred dollars add a thermostat another couple hundred dollars you're talking almost two thousand dollars you know investment to get into to to acquire a con you know a chondro so um i and that's really one of the reasons i started gtp keeper radio was i really wanted to expand the base for folks to the to come into Condra, I'm kind of surprised. It, I mean, it, they're definitely more popular now. I definitely see a lot of people k- keeping them. There's more success with people that are breeding them, which is wonderful. I think it's great for everyone to have all these different resources to acquire animals from. But I still don't think they're as popular as they could be, or as widely widely spread as they could be. I mean, they're always been popular, but the the the, the many the number of people that actually keep them, um, I think could could potentially be more you know what buddy i agree but with you don't you. have enough 
wholeheartedly. We don't have enough people. Uh, but the thing is, Travis and buddy, we don't have enough people willing to be keepers. Right. You, we I don't. think we. So, so listen, I think we have enough keepers. We have a breeder problem too. But I got, I got people. I, I, I got people. I say people say this every shit, every, every couple months. Bro, but, hold on. Before you do that, I but, got every couple months. I got somebody reaching out to me. They'd be like, "Hey, man, I just got this animal. I had this animal for eight months, and I'm about to buy another one." And keys. How? What, what do you think I should do about breeding it? Yeah. So that's the <laughs> you thing. You know what I'm saying? Are you talking to somebody but, who kept these animals for like three or four years before I even? No. I researched the animals three or four years before I even thought about keeping one. I said, I didn't start breeding until like six years ago, so it's hard for me to get them a, a fluff answer, honestly. Right. Well, sometimes yeah, they need also, to hear the honest answer, right? That, that this is this is a long, this is a long, if you're in the breeding, if you want to breed chondros, this is a long-term process. Yeah. Sure, there are people that get lucky and, yeah. you know, require animals, put them together, and they get a clutch. Um, but, you know, if you're looking for long-term success, yeah it 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 takes patience you know I've, this is uh year 18 for me of 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 producing chondros um you know you know to to even say you've done it for uh you know five years of breeding chondros how many people have done that right you look at the number of people not that did not a lot right yeah not so a I, lot I, but, but I'm, yeah. a, I'm gonna say this about about some of the chondro breeders and go ahead, uh, Trav. Go ahead like, Trav. They, they, we need to let Trav off the leash now. All right, <laughs> man. It's some breeders that breed chondros that you know they want to charge a shitload of money for the animals. And trust me, I get it. The animals to them are worth a shitload of money. But if you want to help out the the chondro community, people have to be honest. And if you try to sell a snake for a shitload of money and that animal don't look like it should cost a shitload of money, you should probably check yourself. And you should probably be more interested in trying to help people out. Because over the course of the years, I had to start off with getting imports. And it worked out for me. And a lot of people that went the route of getting imports, it worked out for them. And there's a lot of people that got a lot of captive bred animals that spent a lot of money on them animals, and them animals didn't look like shit. So all I'm saying is a portion of this is on the shoulders of breeders to just be honest about, you know, how to bring people into these hobbies. Why, to me, it's just like, why do you need to make a shitload of money off of a snake that realistically should cost, you know, eight hundred dollars, nine hundred dollars. Why do you feel Great. that way? That is probably not really worth that. And if you could save, and if you could, if you could save somebody the process of going to get an import, and they don't know how to do it. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Right. But that's my feelings towards it. I know that doesn't make people happy to hear that, but it's a lot of two thousand dollar animals that should cost a thousand dollars. It's a lot of three thousand dollars animals. It should cost twelve hundred dollars. The the price and escalation is. I, I've been amazed by it. I, I mean, yeah, I've it really. Is. <laughs> the 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 price escalation since COVID, I guess, has has been amazing, and um, I don't know if it's yeah. just sustainable or not. Um, and. You know, who knows what the market will bear? You know, it, it might be that, um, you know, I, I remember for a long time, you know, a very high end neonate was five thousand um, dollars. Yes, that has actually obviously shifted a lot. And for a long time, all chondros, sure. regardless of who they were or where they were from, were seven hundred and fifty dollars, regardless of neonate color. Um, then those type of things, and then, sure. and then one. You was one of them people. You you still one of them people, buddy. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, still, like, I still try I to do that. I, I do still try site, to do that. On your site, it was it was like a flat line for red and a flat line for yellow. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I remember that. Yeah. And it was yeah. they them items were super cheap. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Oh yeah. I would, now, I am, was like, I, you was charging like a third of what people were charging now. Right. Yeah. I, and I caught a lot of flack for that too. Uh, particularly when I went to reptile shows um, with with people who were um, working with a lot of higher end animal than I did. I, I would leave the shows just like sold out. Right. You know, my five, my five hundred dollar animals, I would go with 10 of them and they would be gone. But see, right? but here's the thing. Exactly. Though. Here's the thing, though, what you were Ooh. doing was see. What you did was you put animals in people's hands at a cheaper right. price point. So worst case scenario, they can be like, well, you know what? I only paid this for it. Best case scenario, some crazy shit happened. Now they running back at your door like, hey, look, remember you did this? I need one of these again. And I right. think that's something that Travis and I talk about, too. You know, it's like, yeah, you can you can hit somebody over the head and rob them for eight thousand dollars once. But then they'll never mess with you again because, the, you know, it's better for them to leave you spending less money and feeling like, oh, man, look what I got. There's a post of. Damn, man, I paid this for this and from that dude over there. And I feel like I feel like he, he robbed me with no gun. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, it's interesting. I mean, it's just interesting. I mean, the, the price of everything is. But then you got them condos that like say lemon tree stuff. Right. Hey, this is what this is because it's not enough of this left. And, right. Yeah. You know. The people right. that know different. that and know lineages and stuff, yeah, they they know that. I right, that's what that is, right? <laughs> you shouldn't go crazy to him trying to lower that, you know. I think that that's a different scenario because not only is lemon tree, you know, a designer chondro, it's also rare. Um, yeah. and also before we get out of here, Dimitri had a question um, about. Uh, he says, "Whatever happened to your?" Shy girl times G S A S zero eight zero three animal, and uh, after that, hmm. I want to get into before we before we get out of here. I want to talk about GCP Keeper Radio a little bit. We didn't get to yeah, that. sure. Yep. Yeah, uh, so I'm not too. familiar with that animal. Did it have a name? No, it that was some great Maxwell, right? Shy. Yes. So shy girl. So G S A S was Greg Stevens. Ali Stevens. Um, whatever happened to you, Shaggo? I've never had an animal from Greg Stevens. Oh, 0803 animal. So is that, uh, I guess I have to ask the question is, is uh, see if we can figure this out. So is that two thousand? Is that two thousand two thousand eight point three? My clutch. I, hey, I don't know what Dimitri says. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, Dimitri, um, I nah, don't I know. I don't recognize that. Greg Stevens clutch. Yeah, that was from a Greg Stevens Alley Stevens animal. Um, I didn't have. I've never had a Greg Stevens animal in my collection, but. Um, if you have a picture of the animal, can you send it to me? Or if you know the, the ID. And then we'll we'll figure out what happened to that animal. Okay, okay buddy. Let's talk about GTP uh, key radio. All right, you guys ready? You're getting an exclusive. With, with, with Bill you guys Steve. ready? Yeah. You guys ready? You're getting an exclusive. Yeah. April 21st, yeah. GTP Keeper Radio returns. Oh, okay. snap. Right. Yeah. Right. Into it. We like it. We want to hear yep. more, from, more from it. Yep. So we're, we're uh, it's just going to be a Bill and I kind of hanging out, catching up type thing. So can't guarantee it'll be a full episode, but that, that's what we're planning on. Um, uh, I don't know how tuned in you guys. I've done a couple other podcasts recently, but I had some, uh, I had some serious life issues last year, health issues, and so I had to put GTP Keep Ready on the back burner till till that all got figured out. Everything was um, okay. Yeah, everything's good now, but you know, it was, it was a little touch and go for a while, a lot of uncertainty, right? And um, 
so we, you know, Bill and I chatted. We had to just put put stuff on the back burner for a little while, and I had to focus on my health and and family members and those type of things and make sure I was good. And but we're yeah. we're coming back. We're gonna we're gonna come back. We um, so we're coming back with just a hangout episode, and then there is a uh, there's a there's a keeper, a GT uh, P keeper, um, who I know. Um, you guys may know Colin. Uh, he was on the MVF low key condo keeper. He's actually an, uh, he actually uh, is an animal caretaker and he actually at the facility he worked at, he put a male and a female green tree python together in a display cage. And, uh, there was some of this shared on the Morelia of Eardis forum, Facebook page by Tim Morris. Anyway, the animals, uh, produced uh, the female laid a clutch, the clutch hatched, um, and they all this was done in the 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 uh, display cage of this uh, facility that it worked at. So it was open to the public. So the female the uh, the female laying the eggs was open to the public. The female incubating the eggs was open to the public. Really? The eggs hatching, and then the neonates were actually kept for a while inside of. The enclosure, and they tried to establish the innates inside the enclosure with the parents. Um, so I might try to, we might try to get him on for an episode just to talk to him about that experience and how unique, you know, think about how unique that is. Um, yeah, we we for, listen to the we listen to GTP Keeper Radio. I'll be on the lookout for that. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. you know, and We're, we, you guys know what, what we try to do. We just try to bring people on that have had. Uh, Success working with the animals, and uh, just really to inspire other people to, to give green tree pythons a, a try. Yeah, yeah. I used to. I went through all the GTP Keeper Radio episodes. Yeah, I didn't think I I'm sorry. Uh, no, nah. <laughs> four or five times. This, this is what happened when I first. It, so it happened right before the pandemic. So like. Mm. In the month of December of 2020, um, so I worked with a bunch of military. Uh, so like they were all gone, so nothing was really working. So I listened to like all the GTP ra- uh, radio episodes before then, and uh, you know I enjoyed listening to them. I still listen. Well, to thank them. you. Because I got to listen. I got listen to them on the uh, the Apple op- the Apple podcast mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, so I had to listen to all of them that way. And uh, yeah, I, I listened to them and I appreciate you guys for putting that type of stuff out, uh, which is, you know, in part has inspired this show because uh, we really like having people give really yeah. in depth information about the why. The day on the Tuesday episode was nice. The, yes, yeah, it that was. was a good one. Yes, it was. That was one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. that was my favorite one, I think. Yeah. We I met him um, at ICAST in 2013, and um, when we started the show, that was one of the one of my goals was to actually have him on to talk about his research that he was doing with green tree pythons. I mean, he's yeah. he's done a lot more since then, and uh, it, it's you know just to you know I I I assume that it would be a dream job. Um, you know, to live in the bush and go do research with green tree pythons. <laughs> but maybe I'm making it more glamorous, sound more glamorous than it really is. But um, yeah, that, that was that was a good show. I really liked that like that show. The research he went into that paper, how he was saying how yes. he went to museums, zoos, exhibits. He was scraping up GTP carcasses from everywhere, counting the bones. <laughs> <laughs> he bone structures on different localities. That was crazy. Man. He, then that was all a, before they went out into the wild trying to catch. Yes, him. he came to ICAST and um, he had just finished doing research. So you guys have been around long enough. You 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 know you know that there's always been some question as to whether the farm bred animals. W- were they truly farm bred or were they imports? Particularly, you know, you guys have been around. You would see these adult animals come in for, you know, and being sold for $500. And you would think to yourself, how can a farm 
produce this animal, raise Correct. it to adulthood, and sell it Correct. for five hundred dollars. Like that, just you know, that just. Uh, I know things are cheaper in Indonesia, but it just doesn't make sense business wise. Like there's only like so two hundred dollars more than probably, a baby. It's probably the same feeling that you get when you see like. The World Series, like the Little League World Series, to see all the Dominican kids are like they're seventeen years old. Right, it's the same feeling. So that's some thirty year old Dominicans in the, in the uh, Little League. <laughs> so, so, so Daniel did this research. He went out. He went out and he went out with the with the the, the snake collectors, and he marked the snakes by cutting scales on their bellies. Yeah, in a way that he could identify him, and then he weighed it, and then he went into these farms, as I used farms, um, and the animals that were slated for sale were the animals that a few weeks ago had been collected in the wild, and that were now being presented as farm bred animals, and every single farm in Indonesia was complicit in this practice. Um, so Daniel came to ICAST, the International Collective Arboreal Symposium, to present his research. And at ICAST also was uh, Cameron Templeton, who owns Bushmaster. Yeah. So you want to talk about a contentious evening when Daniel presented this research that every farm in Indonesia uh, was essentially uh, lying about not all of their animals, but some of their animals uh, being farm bred when in fact they were actually wild caught and being sold and presented as farm bred animals to you know, Europe and the USA so Cam, uh, Cam to put reptile the market. So that was that was pretty contentious. He was very brave to do that. It was it was very contentious because did, you know, how did Cam react to that? Who wasn't happy? You got to him He was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> and of course we had we he had people there that were his long term friends. He had um of course. um gosh, who was there? Uh, Eugene Bissett, one of his long term, you know, long term friends. Eugene Bissett was there, was like, you know, is this true? You know, it, it was a it was a it was a pretty contentious and shocking moment to be present for that. But you know what? The research doesn't lie, right? Yeah. Yeah, and true, so true. That you know that that was you know, and to be honest with you, we knew that that was the case. That these older animals were not farm bred; they were wild of caught. Course. There's no, of there's no model that for success for you know selling these adults for five hundred dollars when you're selling these you know alleged farm bred babies for eight hundred or nine hundred dollars, yeah. right? We so, sold my farm bred animals with. These little bumps that that appear to <laughs> come from parasites. Behold this farm bred animal. Like it's not farm bred. This thing has been in a yeah. while. Look at all the scars on his head. This thing has yeah. not been in a while. Yeah. This thing has not been on a farm. This thing has been in a while scratching yeah. and clawing to survive. Right. But see, you're you're and you're an educated keeper. There are people that go to reptile shows who've always wanted a green tree python that you know, have maybe scratched the surface of the information that's available to them, and they are they told that like, this hey, is uh, I bought this, this is captive a captive bred. Yeah, this is a captive bred animal from a farm in Indonesia. Say, buddy, they don't even say farm no more. They say yeah. they call it captive bred. Captive bred, right? And you know, so you go home <laughs> thinking you have a quality captive bred animal, unaware that it may be you know loaded internal with internal parasites. Yeah. Or God knows what else, right? Um, and so you're you're you know not really setting yourself up for success, or not. and unfortunately, that one bad experience may completely turn somebody away from keeping green tree pythons in the future. Yeah, that is true. The thing that's about why we, like when you get of, imports, of our, uh, of our import, uh, our import episode, Travis, remember? Yeah, yeah. So, so we talked about this. So the thing about imports is me and Keno can both attest to this. You can get an import in and you can let it run through your hands and you can get it cleaned up 
and you can tell which animals have been in the wild and which animals are farm bred. And the animals that are all scarred up and they have weird scales and shit, you can tell which animals are actually farm bred and which animals are fight club in the wild bred. <laughs> So right. you, so so you and can, the wild you can animals, wild animals move exceptionally well on the ground. Yes, extremely Boy. well on the ground. Boy. You put them in the grass. <laughs> you will get low on your ass. Yeah. <laughs> but you put with Captain Brad Adam on the ground, they be looking like me like, what is this? They what stay, is they this shit? For like ten minutes, like ten minutes before they start moving. But a wild caught animal boy. I got I got some wild caught animals and like I'm afraid to put them in the hedges because they'll be gone quick. <laughs> you know? And it's not that much space, but they think that they got a lot of space, and, but they will get going on you quickly. If I take one of the ones that's farm bred, it's just like, what you put me down here for a player? What you, what you <laughs> got me down here to go for? up? The wild ones, they get out of there. <laughs> they just look like, they're, they're gone. You put them on the ground, and they turn back and look at, look at you. Just like, what are you doing? Get me off the ground. <laughs> For real. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't let it be one of your actual captive bred animals. They just look look there and it's like, well, I guess he's cleaning up the cage. And, uh, soon I'll get some more fresh water and Please put me back in my box. I, you come like, like that's... They, they sitting there, they sitting on the purse. They just got comfortable with the sleep. <laughs> like the ones I actually bred here. Like I, I just look at them. I'm just like, we can't leave y'all out in the wild. Y'all not gonna make it. <laughs> but you know, for real, <laughs> you get picked off by by a bird or something. Um. So we're getting close to the end. I want to get to 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 whatever you wanted to talk about that we didn't talk about. Like we can go over mm. this fun. Yeah, geez. Little I don't know. Nothing really is coming to mind. Um, I think we've you know covered a lot of the different aspects. I mean, I guess the only thing we never talked about was like egg incubation. I am not a fan of maternal incubation. Oh no, Bill Hoffman, he's gonna write you a scathing letter. It's That's gonna okay. be real. It's gonna be. I'll, Karen I'll, I'll work in the medical field. You cannot hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so why are you not a fan of uh, maternal? And how do you uh, how do you incubate your eggs? Uh, I'm Tim Morris, man. He likes maternal incubation. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you <laughs> can be friends with people questions. you don't agree with. That's fine. <laughs> see, uh, hey, look and see, buddy, that right there. We need more people like that. Dang, that's right. You mean yeah. that? Just that, to be honest, that's what about makes it. the world go round. Yeah. Um, I don't like midgets. <laughs> I love, I love little people. You know. So, um, so when I I started breeding pythons. Back in the late '80s, early '90s, there was a book out by Ross and Mark, no, Doctor Ross. Just, Dr. Ross just passed away, but that book outlined how to breed snakes, how to breed pythons in general, how to build an incubator, and all that stuff. And so that book really led to the python boom of the '90s because that book gave you the recipe for how to incubate python eggs and how to breed pythons. So the whole Python boom was a result of that. Had we not had that information and had to solely rely on maternal incubation for pythons in general, I think the hobby would look a lot different. And I think that animals in general would definitely would be more expensive. Um, and yeah, so it would, it would not be a lot being produced. Right, exactly. And think about the toll that takes on females. You know, sometimes I've had females go back to back years. Maternal incubation, maybe you would not be no, able to do it. Like Tim, maybe said he had a, he, Tim said he had a female who goes three straight years and maternal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well those those the the uh his um Mr. Blue was out of one of the clutch out of one of those clutches. Right. That he did maternal. Um and Tim's uh, so Tim 
his animals were young too. I think his female is like two or three. She was very yeah, young. She was three. Very, very, very yeah. young. But that was how we did things back in the nineties. You fed them heavy. You bred them young, right? Shut up, stuff. Um, but they, I, I just don't think that we would have the numbers in, in captivity. <laughs> well, I got a question for you. With sure. with that being said about maternal incubation, I'm how sorry, did you buddy. go? <laughs> okay. How did you go through the process of seeing, you know? animals being maternally incubated and understanding that synthetic incubation was still a way off from being as foolproof now as it was back then. Right. So I've, I've, I've tried maternal incubation one time and it was never, never with a chondro species. So all the pythons I bred in the nineties, they were all incubated in an incubator taken away from the female. Um, and then chondros, I've never even tried it. Not even once. Not even thought about it. Um, and so he's I a, think that he's a has my own eggs. That's right. We will, <laughs> my own we will put them in the incubator of not relying on the female. Um, because you know, you, sometimes you get a clutch and there's a couple, you know, dud eggs in there. And um, if they're in the in the actual mound of eggs, they can cause the eggs to uh, the the whole clutch to go bad. And a lot of people have documented that. So just for the you know for the health of the female <laughs> you know for the health of the female just no, really no really no need to do it yeah it seems like it that it, 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 i saw a post on facebook i guess somebody they got rid of the incubator and they wanted to like maternally incubate eggs and the mom was like sitting up top and just like well it looks like you're in shit now, man, because she doesn't yeah, want to be a mom. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's how it goes. I mean, if you wanna if you wanna make sure that your female is not gonna maternally incubate those eggs, don't have an incubator set up. You're pretty much gonna set yourself up for failure. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like she was like steward for bad TV. Look what I can do. <laughs> Just leave these eggs out to dry. <laughs> Oh man, that's terrible. Um, I don't. I, I would like to know, like, how you went down the process of figuring out incubation on your own. Oh well, I I didn't figure it out on my own. Thank goodness. I had, <laughs> I had um, my first chondro clutch. I so when prior to chondros. All my python eggs were placed on vermiculite. All of my python eggs were on vermiculite. And I closed that incubator and I maybe checked it two or three times during the incubation process. and didn't mess with anything. Um, with Contros, um, I, I, uh, I you know, had Tim, Morris, uh, Marshall Mendez help me out. Hey, shout out to Marshall Mendez. Yeah, Marshall. Um, and I initially set up using the no substrate method. And I freaked out because about five weeks in, they started to dent and never had I seen a, a python egg collapse. So I, I freaked out. I mixed up vermiculite and I put those eggs on the vermiculite and back in the incubator they went. <clears throat> had 100% hatch rate. Hmm. Um, and they plumped back up. So that was my first experience. And so the second clutch I let uh, with no substrate method, I just let go. <clears throat> but I had people guiding me the whole way. I did not have to figure out anything on my own. I had great people surrounding me who were like, you know, I'd send them a, a photo. You know, is this normal? That's normal. Don't worry about it. But I had people the entire way walking me through the process of, you know, how you would do this. But thank goodness I didn't have to figure it out myself. Okay. So then how does that evolve to now? How do you uh, incubate your eggs now? I still use a no substrate method. Um, it depends really on the, I've had eggs and the females laid eggs and the egg, egg shell's been very, very thin. 
and I've noticed that they uh, start collapsing much sooner than maybe a, a truly fully calcified egg. So in those instances, I've set them on uh, vermiculite and I put them in deli cups. The eggs are in deli cups with vermiculite. And then I put four or five eggs in that deli cup. Um, and th they're obviously in a, in a uh, egg container, a homemade one that I made, you know, 15 years ago that I'm still using, which is a, a, a just a Canberra food container. Um, and then I have other eggs that, you know, feel perfect. I just, I put them right on top of the, uh, the lighting grid and uh, that, which is suspended over water and I just let them go. And I've, I've actually, uh, a few years ago, I was talking to Harlan. He was saying that he had was incubating chondro eggs at like 86 and a half, 86.5 degrees. And um, I was 80, I had incubated at 87.8 and for years. And so I tried it and it worked. And the eggs now take about 54 days as opposed to 50 days. Um, it does seem that the babies are a bit larger when they hatch, which is a good thing. Um, so that's really the only thing I've, I've changed. The entire process through chondros, I've I don't drop the incubator temperature, or I don't start off with a lower temperature and build the temperature and then drop it back down. I just do a, a straight temperature throughout the incubation process. Okay, and you got uh, your hatch rate has been one hundred percent since you started it. Oh no, they have not been one hundred percent. No, I, I mean I've had clutches that have been one hundred percent. But I've also had clutches that maybe have been like you know, 30 percent. Um, don't necessarily know that that's uh, the fault of the incubation method, as maybe it is to the health or compatibility of the animals. What type of tub are you using for the eggs or for babies? For the eggs, it's a Cambro food box. I think it's a half size food box. And there's a lid that goes with it. And that's what I use. And um, it could hold a sizable clutch. Probably could easily hold 25 eggs if it had to. Um, and the box, which is something uh, the advice I've taken from Tim. So a lot, when I first started using the box, I was concerned because condensation would form on the top of the egg boxes in the last couple of weeks of incubation. Yeah. And I was concerned that the water would drip down on, on the eggs, um, especially if I had to like move the egg box. So Tim had suggested set the egg box up on a slant um, so that any condensation just rolls down oh, to the front of the egg box. So that's what I do. I set them up at a slant and the condensation just rolls away from the eggs. So I don't have to worry about the condensation on top of the eggs. So I use uh, Cambro as well. So I was okay. talking to, to to Bill Hoffman earlier, and this is my thing because my egg box is pretty. It's like it's pretty wide and it's pretty high, and I think one of the things that's helped me reduce condensation is the fact that the eggs are maybe two three inches from the bottom, but they still have like a full eight inches mm. from the top. And I think right. that, like, I have I have a lot of good humidity, but I don't have the condensation issues I used to have. Right. What, and what were you using previously that you had the, uh, a lot of condensation? Stuff I shouldn't have been using. Uh, one of them, <laughs> <laughs> one of them, the first egg boxes I used for my first clutch, that one was the small... Uh, sim containers, which was mm. basically, it was base, it was so humid. It's just like just a bunch of wet farts in a Ziploc bag. That's just <laughs> all it was. The condensation was crazy. <laughs> and it's like, for, what is, what? for what it's worth, I don't think the I don't think the water uh, water droplets uh, affect the eggs over the past two weeks. Yeah, I think I, well, no, because I had one that was messed up in the last two weeks, and I think it got some consistent dripping. Um, and I mean, you got consistent dripping, you you got an issue. Yeah, uh, we're not gonna consistent. say what that's cultural, <laughs> but I think it's <laughs> but, uh, but I, think if, 
I think if you get <laughs> my stereo, yeah. yeah. I think if you get like one or two drops in your eggs during the last week, I don't think it'll help. It'll affect it. Yeah. It, I mean, they're not really the embryos no more. They, right. They give enough their own heat at that point. Yeah. 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 Uh, then I have one more. I have one more thing to ask you. I forget what it was. Okay. Because I am dumbass. I should have wrote it down. I wrote everything down with that one. <laughs> oh. What was it about? You forget? Yeah. Well, we can always bring Buddy Bashimi back if he'll come back. Um, absolutely. I, I think that we absolutely enjoyed I know I absolutely enjoyed this one. Um, I'm glad I, I had fun too. Yeah, you know what, buddy? Oh, you know too. What? Everybody Man, that's associated. Any, anybody 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 that's willing to sit down and talk snake with us, I appreciate it. Anybody Likewise. that's associated with, with Tim Morris is great. Now, if you're associated <laughs> I know with I want Tim. To say. I know what I want to say, too. I got it. If you're associated with Tim, then you are also associated with Ope Doll. Oh, let James Ope Doll. Yeah, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Have you ever got blottoed with this man? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you asking, you so, uh, <laughs> anybody that knows Hope Doll, I gotta yeah. Ask so many, question. many, many years ago, there was a, an event in Maryland, a Condro event, and that's the first time I met James through Tim. And um, yeah, yeah, oh my gosh, what a wild night that was! I'll never forget that night. When you met Ope Doll, did you think that he was a person that was definitely born at a in a circus? Like, like not like his parents <laughs> went to the circus; he was born there. Like his parents worked for the circus. Hey, he's part of the show, <laughs> and like they had him. <laughs> he gonna whoop your ass if we ever go to Daytona, man. Yeah, he probably he, is gonna he, beat my ass. <laughs> he just likes to have a good. He, he, he my first impression of him is he just likes to have a good time. And That's no one's going to stop him. That was <laughs> He's it. He's a wonderful dude. <laughs> Shout out to Old Dog. <laughs> no. Hey, special point to Buddy, though. You, I think you're the first guest that came on that with the brick behind you. That, I'm sorry, that was yeah. what? With the brick. You got the brick behind you right there. You're the first guest that came oh, on. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. The ambiance. I like the ambiance. The, the Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> The bricks and the sex light, they work in right. They really work in <laughs> You can't no. so this is where uh, this is where we do GTP keeper radio. But we don't do the we don't do a video feed. So you would never know that this yeah. is exactly how we do it. But who pick out the music for GTP keeper radio? That's actually Marshall Mendez who played that. Yeah. Oh, that's his actual song, really. Yeah, that's Marshall. Um oh, okay. so that that's kind of a cool thing. We asked Marshall, hey, could you do something for us for an opening? So he yeah. threw together a guitar riff and well, we've used it that. ever since. So okay. it's kind of, you know, like it, it, it fits. It has a con, you know, got this guy that's been doing condros forever. Yeah. The musician. Um when and that's that, his contribution to that, the show. When I hear that guitar pick, I know that I know the GTP cable radio. That's it. It's like, That's it. It's, what it say? It's like you are now locked in. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You got yeah. That's the, um... Don't let this yep. man. Marshall ripping it out for us. Sound effects in front of you, man. No, that, that's fire though. Yeah, Marshall hooked us up. Marshall's always to me seemed like a really down to earth guy. He came to the show Definitely. one time. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful yeah. experience. Keno, you figure out your questions? No, that was the one. Um, I wanted to give him the brick. You know, give him the brick thing. Okay. Well, you know, you got anything else that you want to say before we get you out of here, buddy? Because I think we got to get you back. <laughs> I, think, I, I would love I, I to come back. I had a great time. Um, so just, I just want to say thanks for, thanks for, uh, Thinking about me and wanting me to come on your show, it's humbling uh, to have people want you to be on 
their podcast and you know and it's fun to be on the other side it's fun to be uh the interviewee as opposed to the interviewer right yeah. so it's it's more for me it's more relaxed i feel um and it's just good i like i like the it's a great experience i really i really enjoyed the show um now yeah, any if you would like to have me come back I'll, I'll do my best to make it happen yeah we'll try to get you back did you have any problem with your promo videos because it could have been no i loved it somebody. it was hysterical it i worse. absolutely loved it <laughs> Okay. All right. I love okay, I love one. that I can take a hit to the back and not even flinch. <laughs> <laughs> no, you never been power drive to a steel cage. Man. And I'm also I am also a great shot too. Yeah. So I don't know if you guys knew that, but I actually am very good at that. So did that worked you, out. You like, you, are you guys stalking me on my other face on my other Instagram? Uh, Nah, I don't know, buddy. We just, we just know. This is just from our imagination. <laughs> I mean, we, we hope that you're not together, really. Buddy, that's all. We hope that you're not really greasing yourself up and sliding through storm drains. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the the goo grease. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, buddy, we appreciate you for coming through. You got to come back. How um, many clutches know... you got cooking, cooking, buddy? Um, I have two clutches in the incubator right now. I had a clutch hatch about a month ago. You're not supposed to admit to that, buddy. You're supposed to just pop up with the new clutch. The, the, how many more? Yeah. Uh, how many more parents you got paired this year? I'm done. For, I'm done for this season. Right. <laughs> so I'm thinking about already thinking about September. Right. So trying to figure out what to do in September. I'm gonna be taking naps in September. Uh, <laughs> that's all I hear for sure. I swear. I am an old I'm an old ass man. I'm terrible. You like 78. Uh, 78 and a 35 <laughs> year old body. Listen, bro, if it was socially acceptable for me to wake up and wear long johns and curse everybody in my house out, I would definitely be doing it. Because you have a kid, you have a kid that's not walking on your grass. Yeah. <laughs> if I could if I was like, you know, like 70 year old men, like when they get drunk and piss on themselves, like I would oh, be geez. I would be that guy. <laughs> no, you I don't pee, I want to peel myself yeah. and then everybody clean me up and make sure I'm gonna be running sometimes like what's that with <laughs> I just be wondering what's that with. <laughs> How, why are we friends? <laughs> you said that. He said, "Just wake me up for Easter." <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll take a picture with the family looking cleaned up. <laughs> with, a high yellow, with a high yellow suit on. Oh man, yeah, I'll be the worst drunk grandpa ever. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> Oh man, I gotta stop thinking about all the bullshit I would do if I was a drunk ass grandpa. Oh, um, thank you <laughs> to everybody that showed up. And they say they say I be tripping. <laughs> you do for nah. the most. So sometimes it's me. Um, uh, but but thank you to everybody that showed up tonight. We had a good time. Um, it was a pleasure we really talking appreciate to you, buddy. buddy. It was wonderful. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining us from Italy. <laughs> Actually, if you read my Facebook profile, it's France. France. Okay, yeah. France. But that's been us for the Conjo Bar Room. Special thanks to Buddy Bushimi, our for sponsor, sure. Chris from Interbox 3D. And that's it for us tonight. Y'all take care. Have a good night. Hey, look out for that GTP cable radio on the 21st. Exactly. And possible CVR shirts. Oh, yeah. All right. Till next week, y'all. Peace.